Hi, I'm Adam Camilleri, and welcome to episode 5 of Gaming Against the Grain. This is a Warhammer 40k podcast which tries to make uncompetitive armies work. An overview of today's episode, we will be covering listener questions. Uh, we have two Salamander army lists for review, so due to that I'm going to be doing a bit of a mini Salamander's overview and then touching on both lists. I've also got a Thousand Suns list to review. I've also then, um, Arc 40k just wrapped up this weekend, so we're going to be covering that. I'm going to uh, do an event recap, covering my performance and thoughts. Then I'm going to do a tactical dissection of my list and the units I took. And then I'll be finishing up with the hottest topic in 40k today, which is slow play. So first, onto listener questions. And Brian asks, Adam, I'm trying to craft a Black Templars slash Sisters of Battle list, with the idea being that my wife will play Sisters of Battle and I'll play Black Templars. Um, and we can play together on a team with our friends and still manage to win against our friends who are fairly competitive. We don't plan on winning any tournaments, but we'd like to have fun with a list that can hold its own. I'm a big Tyranids player, so crafting non-bug lists have been an issue for me. We were hoping 2,000 points total, with the Black Templars being an aggressive force to charge up the board and tie up enemy units, while the Sisters hold objectives and attempt to make opponents think twice about deep strike and charging them with flamers. So I guess my total question is, Adam, is, Adam, how do I make Black Templars and Sisters work together in the same army? But really, if there is any synergy between the two that I'm simply not seeing, or if you have seen a strategy that might work, I would really appreciate it and all information. Just try and have an awesome time with my wife and win games. Now, the idea of playing games with your wife is like having your cake and eating it too. And if you can make that situation work, you're a legend, my friend, and all the power to you. Now, uh, my notes on this is uh, Sisters and Black Templars can work quite well together. Uh, Black Templars have uh, good range weapons, like all Space Marines do, whereas Sisters kind of do not. Um, the Exorcist is the only real long, long range option, and it's an amazing, amazing model, but it's pretty unreliable. So the idea would be kind of use the Black Templars as the blood instrument to the Sisters' scalpel. And you could do this by using kind of waves of bodies and massed fire from the Black Templars, while the Sisters kind of pack mobility and lots of special weapons, which is kind of what they do best. Um, this would probably look like a, a Land Raider Crusader comboed with some Vanguard Vets or Assault Marines. And for going inside, you can the Land Raider Crusader, you could put a 15-man Crusader unit to tie up things, and then you've got one spot left for a support character. Now, in this iteration, you could either go Hellbrecht or you could go Grimaldus. In... And for Fluff, I'd probably go Grimaldus. He gives rerolls to hit in combat, which is what you want to be. You want to be aggressive in tying things up, as you've said. And he also gives that better leadership. Now, on top of that, he also gives exploding sixes to hit. So if you hit with a uh, on a six, you get another attack. And if you're taking uh, Vanguard Vets and Assault Marines, they can also combo that really well. I suggest if you're looking for mass attacks, use two uh, chain, chain swords on your Vanguard Veterans. So they've got four attacks each. And then they can have exploding sixes and rerolls to hit. That'll make them into quite the blender. Now, if you want extra mass fire on top of that, pretty much any of the Space Marine flyers is a really good source of DACA. Especially, of course, the Storm Ravens. And if you wanted to, you could also take an aggressive uh, Dreadnought with the Storm Raven to add extra aggression. And on the sister side, uh, Dominions are really formidable and pack a wallop. Uh, it's also the best way of getting emulators into range of their weapons quickly because uh, if you didn't know, Dominions get a scout move and anything there inside gets a scout move too. So by using that on emulators, you get them into range first turn, second turn really easily. Uh, on top of that, I'd use some basic sisters in rhinos with just bolters and maybe one special weapon for holding midfield and then a few units of Dominions to take, in, uh, take out key units. So add on to that some Seraphim for harassment and to support the Crusaders. Now, Seraphim are really good. I, I'd highly suggest using them. So this will end up being pretty fluffy and should pack a punch. Now, if you want to go up a level in competitiveness, I'd look into the Forge World Repressors for your Dominions uh, because they have this incredible open tops, a special rule from last edition where they have all these fire points. And uh, one of the best things about them is when you double move those with the Dominions, you'll usually be, usually be in really good range for either Melters or Storm Bolters first turn, and you'll be able to lay your opponent out quite reliably without getting out of your uh, vehicles and exposing yourself, because you're just toughness three with three up save, so you'll get clean pretty quick. On top of that, you can add Celestine and some Seraphim to Bodyguard her. So she'll give the Seraphim a, a five plus uh, re-rollable invuln save, which makes them pretty reliable at bodyguarding her, and they can all jump around together and be a real nuisance. 
On the Black Templar side, you might want to look into using min squads of Crusaders with one special weapon and a heavy weapon if you want to, but you don't need to, and then uh, a dual lightning claw or power weapon, and then chuck those in Razorbacks. This will combo really well with the sisters, and when you add it all up, it will be a hell of a lot of board control and firepower. So you can have your choice. If you need the extra long range on the Razorbacks, you could probably go Twin Laz Cannon, or if you're going to be more mid-range, you go Twin Heavy Bolter or Twin Assault Cannon. So yeah, Brian, hope that hope that helps and hope you uh, gave you some good ideas. Now, that was it for the listener questions for this week and on to list reviews. And uh, first up, we've got two Salamanders lists to go through today. So I'm going to go through both uh, and give a quick overview of what Salamanders do and what they've got going for them and some basic thoughts on each list. So the first one's from Mark Dawson and he writes, Hi, Adam. Just wanted to say that I'm really enjoying the channel so far and really looking forward to what's to come. None of my mates are into 40k and only and I only get to play with random gamers when I go down to the club and would love to get someone else's view on my list. I currently play Tau, but I'm looking to start a new collection and a new army soon. I've set it on salamanders mainly because I love how they look and can't wait to paint the flames on everything. I'm not so seriously competitive, uh, probably won't be going to any tournaments anytime soon, but as I don't want a list that will just get rolled over every time I play it. I have put together a list that I'm happy with and it is very fluffy and I think it will look awesome. My main concern is that it will have a very low model count and I'm not sure how much of a hindrance that will be to actually play. And the list is, he has a battalion detachment with Vulcan, a captain with combi melter, power sword and the salamander's relic mantle. He has three tactical squads, five man each, each one with a melter gun and a combi flamer. He has two company ancients with uh, combi melters and banners, of course. He has a Devastator Squad with four multi-melters and a combi flamer on the sergeant. Then he has a Land Raider Redeemer with an added multi-melter. He has a Land Raider Crusader with an added multi-melter. And he has two Storm Talon gunships with the twin assault cannons and twin laser twin last cannons each. So the idea behind the army is to load all the guys into Land Raiders and drive them straight into the heart of the enemy. And then unload with melters and flamers. The two Storm Talons are there to add a bit of movement for taking objectives as well as Laz Cannon Sniper Fire on bigger targets where the bulk of the army is in the thick of it. I have a good chance of going first against most armies as it only has four drops. The army is built around the Warlord Vulcan his, with his ability uh, to reroll failed hit and wound rolls with all flamer and melter weapons. It's very fluffy. I would have six melter guns, six multi-melters, five flamers and two flamestore cannons all rerolling, as well as the captain rerolling ones on all the bolters and the ancients getting a few extra shots out of my killed marines. I really like the idea of this list but would love to hear what you think. I haven't spent a penny yet so I'm willing to change whatever makes sense. I definitely want Vulcan in the army and some way to use him effectively. I hope you have a chance to look at this. Kind regards from Ireland. Now firstly, that is fucking great that there's someone in Ireland listening to this podcast, and thank you very much, Mark Dawson. Now, moving on to the next one. Uh, hey, buddy, great meeting you at CanCon, and cheers for the llama. I hope you enjoyed the picture. Loving the show so far, and it's awesome to see alternate marine combos. Personally, I've been trying to make salamanders work. I love their chapter tactics and how versatile the squads are with uh, essentially free rerolls. I'd love some feedback on this list. My biggest issue is backline defense which I used to use Celestine to fill at CanCon. But I'm trying some new things out with the new Custodian Shield Captains. Any feedback would be great. Keep up the good work. And this gentleman's name is Dynith Tharusha Layangama. And it's an amazing name too. And I hope I didn't butcher that too badly. Now he presents to me, this is what he's written, presents to you the winning LVO list for 2019. He's aiming pretty high and I love it. He has a Salamander Brigade, and good on him for taking a Brigade as well. He's got a Captain with Bolt Pistol Chainsword, Lieutenant Bolt Pistol Chainsword, another Lieutenant with Bolt Pistol Chainsword, and the Warlord Trait Storm of Fire. He has six five-man scouts with bolt guns, a uh, Company Ancient with Standard of the Emperor Ascendant, two two-man Company Veterans squads, I'm guessing just to fill out the Elite requirements. He has a two five-man devastator squads with three las cannons and a heavy bolter both those have a cherub and he has one five-man devastator squad with three las cannons and a heavy bolter with no cherub in fast attack he has three three-man intercessor squads sorry inceptor squads with assault bolters and his second detachment is a custodes supreme command and this one has three shield captains on dawn eagle jet bikes with hurricane bolters okay pretty good if i don't say so myself it's a solid list and 
actually both of them are quite solid, but for different reasons. Now, I'm going to quickly go over the Salamanders chapter tactics and relics and stratagems and stuff, and then I'll give you some thoughts, and uh, hopefully I can give you guys quite a bit of insight into some things I think that are good. So firstly, the chapter tactic. For those who don't know, uh, Salamanders Master Artisans. You can re-roll a failed single, sorry, a single failed hit roll and a single failed wound roll made for a Salamanders unit with this chapter tactic. So that's pretty legit. Um, then they have their Flamecraft stratagem, which reads, use this stratagem just before a Salamanders unit attacks in the shooting phase. Add one to the wound rolls made for all that unit's flame weapons. For the purpose of this stratagem of flame weapons, any profile is a weapon profile whose name includes the name flame so flame is heavy flame of flamestorm cannon flamestorm golem etc then we have the warlord trait which is add once add one strength uh, to your warlord so your warlord just gets plus one strength then we have the relic which is the salamander's mantle salamander's model only the wearer of the salamander's mantle increases their toughness characteristic by one and lastly we'll focus on their last unique thing which is of course their special character Vulcan Histan now he's got a I guess a regular chap uh, captain's stat line movement 6 weapon skill blue skill 2 strength and toughness 4 5 wounds 4 attacks leadership 9 and 2 plus save now where he gets a bit special is that he comes with a 3 plus invulnerable straight off the bat he can he gives you regular rights of battle so your regular captain reroll ones in a 6 inch aura uh, apart from that, he has a Heavy Flamer, and his Spear of Vulcan is plus 2 strength, negative 2, and d3 damage. So it's a essentially a souped-up Force Axe, I guess. Now, his, where he gets really exciting is that he gives a Gilliman-level buff to Flamers and Melters in his army. So Forge Father is a special rule, and it reads, You can reroll failed hit and wound rolls for friendly Salamander models within 6 of Vulcan that are firing Melter or Flame weapons. For the purpose of the ability, Melter is anything with Melter, Flame is everything with Flamer. And of course, his Gauntlet of the Forge is also a Flame weapon. So that's pretty exciting, really. Now, I'm going to cover each of those in a little bit more detail now. Now, what the chapter tactic is pretty much telling you is that your army should have an MSU focus. Um, it favors min-maxing special weapons or heavy weapons. Now, if you don't know what min-maxing is, it means taking the minimum amount of investment to get the maximum out of your, your special rule. So what you're doing is you'll get a you'll get a tax squad and you'll buy it one special weapon. That's the minimum buy-in to get that special weapon and then you'll take as many of those as you can so you get the most mileage out of that out of that trade and out of that special rule. So what the chapter tactic does, which is actually freaking insane, is it gives every single squad in your army two CPs to use in the shooting phase which is huge absolutely massive now it means this also means that units do not need character support and can operate independently so you, you although vulcan gives an incredible buff which is amazing when you buy into it if you don't want to buy into it you don't need to you can easily scatter your army all across the board and you're getting the best use out of that chapter tactic and you're getting a buff that is quite insane really without any characters, without anything else to make it so. It just happens. Now, the stratagems is very specific, um, with it being, you know, plus one to win on flame weapons. And really, either you build your army with it in mind or don't bother. It's, it's so specific that you really have to probably build one super unit to get the most out of it, and then, and then don't, don't worry about it anymore. Because it's really, it's not all that worth using on one guy with a combi flamer or one guy with a heavy flamer. It would be good, but um, it's probably not all that viable. You're not getting that much mileage out of it. Now, where it would get crazy is aggressors with the double double flamer gauntlets, double shooting them, double shooting them on overwatch, double shooting them on shooting phase when I don't move. Uh, stern guard, because you, you need a five stern guard, you can take two heavy flamers and three combi flamers. That could get insane. And assault centurions, you can have you know two melts or two flamers each while they move up the board. And of course, there's the, the good old faithful uh, land raider redeemer. And those are probably the best options you have available to you to get the most out of that stratagem. Now, if none of those appeal to you, maybe that stratagem is not for you and you should look at other things, maybe stern guard with uh, regular bolters or... Um, just getting min-maxing those special weapons. Now, the Warlord trait is pretty meh. It's kind of meh at best, um, just like the stratagem. It's only real use I see, because, sorry, it's the, it's the plus one strength, so your Warlord just gets plus one strength. The only real use I see is taking it on a guy with a Thunder Hammer, so it gets to that magical strength 10. So they're wounding just about anything in the game on, on, on a three, if not a two for most things. 
Now, their relic is pretty legit. Um, plus one toughness on a beast stick character, and it, it does combo well with that warlord trait. So you could have a toughness six uh, biker character with a strength 10 thunder hammer, and he's going to be rerolling one to hit and one to wound. So that's pretty good. Now, you could also not take that plus one strength warlord trait and instead take the iron resolve warlord trait. So you've got a toughness six, seven wound character on a bike. And that's pretty scary. That, and he also have a six up feel no pain as well. So all of a sudden that is that guy is kind of you know harder to kill than many vehicles, especially if you're going to give him a storm shield as well, which you should. Now all of a sudden this guy can just rock around the board and shit, he's... He is actually just as hard, harder to kill than one of those Dawn Eagle jet bike dudes. He might not be as killy, but if you give him that uh, Thunder Hammer, he can, he can definitely pack a wall up, make him attack twice, and he's pretty terrifying. Now, Vulcan is good. His uh, buffs all work into the style that the army is trying to promote, which is closing with your opponent and either flaming to death to take out hordes or melting to death to take out big units. Um, he has to be used right um, at 154 points. He's not too expensive, but he is over double that of a standard captain and if you're not using his forge father ability he's just an expensive captain because he doesn't do anything else for your army so you can get close to and possibly better mileage out of buying a captain and using the three cp upgrade to make him a chapter master now then he's giving half the buff to of what vulcan is to your flamers and melters so well, not the flamers because i ought to hit but to the melters and he's giving a full rerolls buff to everything else in your army but if you are going to buy into and invest in his trait in uh, Melters and Flamers, Vulcan is he's almost an auto-include at that stage because he's just so damn good with it. Okay, now I'm going to quickly run through uh, the first army again and give my thoughts on it. So it's just scrolling up. So the first army has Vulcan. It has a captain with uh, combi melter and power sword and the plus one toughness mantle, which is the Salamander's Relic again. Three tactical squads. Each one has a melter gun and a combi flamer. Uh, two Company Agents with Combi Melters, a Devastator Squad with four Multi Melters and a Combi Flamer, a Land Raider Redeemer with uh, an extra Multi Melter, a Land Raider Crusader with an extra Multi Melter, and two Storm Talons with Assault Cannons and two Last Cannons each. Now, my thoughts on this list are... It's a good list. It's accurate. But sorry, but it's accurate that you said it lacks board control. It does. It, it really does. Um, it, with only four drops on the board and needing them all to be close to benefit from Vulcan, um, you're not going to be spreading out. If your opponent spreads out on you, you're not going to be able to kill a hell of a lot because the only long range thing in your army is the last cannons on the flyers. Apart from that, nothing is, cl is longer than uh, 24 inches. Now, I, I didn't really want to. I didn't want to gut this list. I'm only going to make small changes to it to shore up some of the things people uh, exploit, and I'd have to completely gut it to add the board presence needed to make up for what it's lacking, and that would take away from what's great about it. So I decided to just add some awesome stuff that I found really. So one one little way you can add a bit of board presence and to shore up one of the big weaknesses, which would be people first turn charging those land raiders and taking them out of the game. It will be to remove the attack marines and add space marine scouts. This stops the uh, land raiders getting charged early and pushes back stuff um, that can punch and kill them as well. Even if that was just another another salamanders unit dropping shitloads of melters on you. They can sit objectives and it, it shores up you know some of the board control stuff. Um, I'd remove uh, the devs and one chapter ancient. This would leave points free for two stern guard squads. And now both of these can be super specialized or you can chop and change and make them kind of 50-50 if you wish. Um, but both of them would be five man. So one with two heavy flamers and three combi flamers and the other one with two multi melters and, and three combi melters. The next one I would do is uh, drop the captain for a Libby with the might of heroes buff uh, power for plus one toughness. Now that is really tasty when you can make one of those land raiders toughness nine. That goes from all of a sudden those las cannons tearing a tearing in a new one to wounding on fours and bouncing, you know, half 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 bouncing off, which is incredible. Now the last thing I would do, <laughs> this is when I, as soon as I saw this list, I was like, oh great, this is something I can finally use this guy for. Drop the land raider crusader and two las cannons off a of storm talon for heavy bolters, and you take a forge world land raider Achilles. This thing is a boss. It has, firstly, it has four multi-melters on it. So all of a sudden Vulcan's buff just goes through the roof. 
plus has a quad launcher, which uh, has two profiles. It's I think it's a four shot strength eight, neg two, three damage, or four D three, strength five, no rend. Um, doesn't leave line of sight on that that profile as well. But what it what's crazy about it is that it comes with a four plus invulnerable save stock and nineteen wounds. So, making that motherfucker toughness nine <laughs> with a four plus invuln and nineteen wounds. It is one of the hardest things to kill in the game. It will be really, really hard to shift. Harder to kill than Bane Blades, harder to kill than Knights. Um, and it, it's packing an absolute wallop when it gets close enough. If you've got four multi melters re rolling to hit, re rolling to wound, holy crap, you'll demolish any big unit in the game. You'll just pull them right down. Now, it's only got a six, six man tra transcript capacity, which is kind of shit, but that allows you to put one of those Stone Guard units, which is why I put them in. Whichever one you need more, if you need the Melters more, you put them in there. If you need the Flamers more, you put them in there. And then either you put the Libby in there or you put the put Vulcan in there. And then you make that guy Toughness Knight and you have a perfect death machine that not many people can stop and it can just roll up, unload, and absolutely decimate. Now you have two Lehman Russes, which benefit completely from Vulcan. You've got the Flame Cannons and that Multi-Melter on the top of that uh, Redeemer, and you've got the Multi-Melters on the uh, the Achilles. And you've got a bit more board presence and some nice surgical tools. So I hope that helped, Mark, because when I saw your list, I was like, oh, I've always been a massive fan of the Land Raider Achilles, and it fits so well into your army because it maximizes on all the things that your army uh, needs it to and it's just a, an incredible unit an incredible incredible unit and look if you think the achilles is not uh, not in a in big trouble because if it's four plus invulnerable 19 wounds you make the you make the redeemer toughness nine and then they've got two really hard choices to make like which one do i try and take out because i might fail um and so yeah that's really cool and that's working into what your list was already doing and to honestly to, to make it have the board presence it needs to turn around the, the issues with it you'd have to gut it and drop at least one of the land raiders i really didn't want to because i thought it was awesome all right, so I hope that helped, Mark. Now I'm going to go over the, the second list again. So and this is from Denith. And he's got his captain with nothing, a lieutenant with nothing, a warlord lieutenant with nothing, and a storm of fire trait. Six five-man scouts. A company ancient with standard of emperor ascendant. Uh, two two-man veteran squads. Two five-man devastator squads with three last cannons each and a cherub. One five-man devastator squad with no cherub and three last cannons and heavy bolter. Three three-man inceptor squads. And then three uh, Custodes Shield Captains on jet bikes. So this mm, looks like a good good list. I love that it's in a Brigade. I think using a Brigade is always a ballsy choice. And if you can pull it off, it pays out. It's good all-rounder. Um, it's focusing on a, dev, a, a Devastator Firebase, but it's not fully committing to it. So it's not committing all of its points to this play. It's still keeping enough points to... Uh, grab objectives to have board presence to be in a lot of different places at once it's pretty competitive and it's a list that looks like it's tuned to pay, play missions pretty well by not going all in on that firebase um, it gives points for the inceptors which is a big plus and for the scouts and for the custard bikes um, you can probably hear me call them custards from now on because then they're custards and but not going all in on that. It gives you, it gives you, it lets you save points to do a lot of other things with your army. Now those custard bikes are incredible, and they will do whatever you need them to do. They're very, very strong, and they're looking like they're going to be a quite a top tier unit in the in the competitive scene. Now this list has great board control uh, and some counter drop units and some synergy in the banner and the cust captain and the lieutenants with the devs. You might want to swap out some las cannons for missile launchers. Um, it has a dual, good dual profile, and will help with some of the horde clearing things that might be issues with you in the long run as you really only have the hurricane bolters and the inceptor to kill big units so if somebody was rocking up with uh you know 90 gene stealers and 100 hormigans just to try and just bury you in waves um you might struggle to dig yourself out now you're not really getting a hell of a lot of use out of the salamanders uh, traits or the stratagem as there's, there's not a single flame in the unit um and I guess you're, you're not buying into what the Salamanders do. You, it's not a bad list at all. It's actually a strong list, uh, but it's, it's counterintuitive to what the Salamanders give you. Um, I don't know if I priced this up wrong, but in my Battle Scribe, when I put it in, it was nine points over. So I might have stuffed it up. But um, So this makes the, the changes and things that I, I thought might be applicable might not fit in as well because I'm working with a list that, I, that was nine points over. So I just left it as is and just made these changes. 
So what I would do is I would drop one Inceptor squad for a Lance Beater with dual heavy bolters and drop a Company Veteran squad for an Apothecary. This doubles down on the synergy with the Devastators. So then when a model, di model dies, <laughs> the bastard shoots on a 3 plus from that Relic Banner and then you bring the Prick back to life as well. So you've lost nothing, you've just gained extra shots. Ap apart from that, this list is locked into a playstyle that it can't really be changed greatly uh, without like the above list gutting it too much. Would be good to get some aggressives, uh, aggressors in there as anti-assault units, which would free up a custod the custode bikes to go and be more aggressive. This also plugs further holes in the horde management. So taking a unit of three aggressors and you, you sit them with your uh, firebase. Now, when someone drops or they finally get through your, your six-man scouts and enables them to drop into your lines, those aggressors can rock up and just level them. You give them rerolls to hit and reroll ones to wound and they will devastate the shit out of units. So, because people have to, if they want to deep strike and be able to charge or be able to be relevant, they're going to be in, inside the double tap range for those aggressors if you stick them with the fire base. So, they're a great counter punch unit, and yet, like I said, it frees up the custode bikes to go out and just do what they do and just destroy everything. So, another option I uh, put in here was to drop the brigade. I know, oh god. You want to keep the brigade if you can. It's such an awesome thing to fill out a brigade with Marines. But you drop the uh, brigade for two battalions and the Supreme Command. Still gives you 10 command points, which is plenty enough for Salamanders. Uh, and will give uh, points extra for the aggressors and could possibly get them in a repulsor too. The alternative is to take uh, dual shooting dreadnoughts. So I don't mean two shooting dreadnoughts. I mean dreadnoughts with two shooting weapons as they get huge and amazing mileage out of the Salamanders trait. They don't need all the support characters there and will put close to equivalent firepower to what you've already got while being far harder to kill. So I hope that helped, Dunith, and I hope you enjoyed the Llama Man. So overall, I think your list is really good and it's a, it's a list that will just outscore people on missions. So I think it's pretty strong, dude. All right, moving on to the final list. For today which is from a good friend of mine named russell wilson who just did very well at arc over the weekend he should be very proud of himself because he's a he's a diehard thousand suns uh, player and he did very well with thousand suns while not using the codex because they the codex didn't come up with the, the cutoff for the event so he has a single battalion as his army and he opens with iron on disc and a demon prince of zinch uh, with hellforge sword and wings then he has 20 zangors with autos auto pistols and chainswords then 20 Rubik Marines with two Soul Reaper Cannons. Uh, then another unit of 20 Zangors. Then he has three units of Zangor Enlightened with the Fate Caster Great Bows. And then he has two Hellbrutes with Missile Launchers and Twin Laz Cannons each. And then finally he has two Zangor Shamans with four staves. So the idea of this list is to keep shit out of range and line of sight turn one as much as possible. The two Hellbrutes are what I want out of line of sight 100%. Now he's gone through his pre-game uh, options. Pre-game, I take the Dark Mantle Crystal and spend one CP to take the Helm of the Third Eye to gain a CP when my opponent uses a stratagem. Then I use one CP and put the 20 rubrics in the webway. Iron Moon, the DP, and the two Shamans stick with the Enlightened to ensure they are a 2 plus re-rollable to hit. They auto wound on a 5 plus, which can be a 4 plus, I'm assuming that's with prescience. Uh, can do a heroic intervention as they'll all have to fly a keyword and then can pull out and shoot. Uh, the DP to give one plus one to wound. And the rubrics, so then the rubrics drop in the center, casting negative one to hit on themselves if need be, and a shaman cast a plus one invuln on them if need be. The lighten are there to one, take board control from the opponent, two, shoot one target and then charge another to stop them from shooting. And then in my following turns, they pop out and shoot again. And three, finish any transports or vehicles that the Hellbrutes fail to kill and remove chaff. They have 54 essentially heavy bolter shots with a very high wound conversion rate. And the Zangors are there to do what Zangors do. Now, I love this list and I love T-Suns and I'm very, very fucking happy they finally got something decent to work with. Now, the Codex isn't super powered by any means, but there is plenty of meat on the bone and there's first time there's been any meat on that dusty, dusty bone in like shit since like fourth edition <laughs> so it's great and um I, I love that i'm seeing lists like this again uh it's got great this list has got great board control in the zangors and the rubrics it's got good synergy with the enlightened and the support characters and it makes great use of rubrics which i believe is a very underestimated play 
Now, rubrics have uh, been much maligned because of their points cost and etc. But they're starting to get quite scary. Like 20 of them dropping into the middle of the board with negative one to hit and a four up invulnerable save is goddamn terrifying to try and remove. Like you have to actively use your anti-tank weapons on those guys to stop them having, having a two up save. Now, if you were to drop those somehow, if there was a piece of terrain big enough to house those 20 guys and you drop them into cover, they will have a one up save. So even if you shoot a negative three one damage weapon at them, they're still having a three up save. It's actually kind of crazy and terrifying. So it'd be a four up save, but still quite, it's crazy. They're so good. And I'm very happy they're so good. Um, it's got some re It's got some reliance on the Enlightened to do the heavy lifting. It's a very, very amazing unit, but it's fragile. And opponents who know how good they are will remove them pretty quickly once they're clued on, which I'm guessing is why you said you need to keep them out of line of sight. Um, Hellbrew's a solid backfield. Nothing really to say there. They just do what they do. Um, so on to my changes. Firstly, give that DP double Malefic Talons. Uh, I don't know why I got the, the the sword in there. I'm hoping that's a typo, but the double Malefic Talons is the way to go. It turns that DP into a really, really good blender. Um, now the Zangors might need the Brayhorn, which gives them plus one advance and plus one charge so that when you teleport them with that Dark Crystal, you get them an eight inch charge rather than a nine. And that is that one inch is really significant. If you can turn it from an eight to a nine, sorry, from a nine to an eight, and you have a CP reroll on those dice, you're actually pretty likely to get him. Now the next one, it would actually be quite a good idea to get some more CP into this list, especially if you told, as you've told me, you, you're spending two at the start of the game. So you're gonna be down to four before the game even starts because you're putting the Rubik's in the webway and you're taking that extra relic. Now in this list, you have three fast attacks and four elites. So what you could do is you drop one uh, enlightened unit down to a six man and drop a shaman. That enables you to take a vanguard detachment with an exalted sorcerer on a disc. This adds another CP. It adds another good uh, psychic support unit. Uh, alternatively, you can take a regular sork on foot and stick them with the hell brutes for psychic support. Um, and after all, you, so this that would be giving them psychic support after all other units push up. So you still have a way of buffing them and keeping them reliable. Next one would be to put that six man to an eight man, and with the eleven points remaining from the Brayhorn, sorry, with eleven points remaining, uh, you can get a Brayhorn for the Zangors you want to teleport. Now I'm I don't have a huge amount to add to this list because this is a very new army to me. I haven't had a massive experience with it. Most of the learning I've done is when I researched this list to see what I could do with it. So I'm not sure how good Rust List is, and it's going to heavy, you know, it's pretty centric on those enlightened and getting maximum usage out of them. And as I've not played against them yet, I'm not quite sure how good they are. On paper, it looks like a hell of a lot of fun with plenty of tactical choices and really solid synergy. Um, but yeah, if you don't use those enlightened well, they could just be a bit of a wet blanket and uh, get taken out quite easily. Because like I said, they're very fragile. Their damage output and their damage potential is quite incredible though. So yeah, I hope that helped Russ and I um, hope I was able to, to give you some pointers for all those lists I did. If you'd like a list reviewed by me or have any questions for me, uh, please email me at gamingagainstthegrain1 at gmail.com. If you're looking for an army review, please attach a paragraph describing what you want the army to do and what you want me to look at. So yeah, thanks guys. All right, moving on to my ARC event recap and my results. So ARC is run and done. It, uh, it was a six game event at 1350 points and it was a fluff, a fluff based event. It's not ITC and it wasn't competitive. Now I went uh, two, three and one and came 14th overall out of 160 players. It was something I'm, I'm pretty proud of seeing as it was my first uh, outing with the uh, Black Templars. So I got to know this army pretty well. I got to know the Templars pretty well, and I found that it had many weaknesses, uh, but quite a few unexpected strengths too. Um, firstly, I'd like to tell you guys that I felt as if I was the underdog in just about every list matchup. So if I looked at his list and looked at my list, I would have been like, his list is better than mine every single time. But um, I managed to play the missions well enough to only lose once. Now, as you'll notice, I had three draws. Now that was due to necessity. The army I played had such a low model count and such a high degree of diminishing returns that I found myself without much choice but to play for the draw in a couple of games. Um, I only really, of, of the three draws I got, I only went into one of those thinking I would need to, to play for a draw from the outset and that was in game five where I was against a pretty strong uh, Primaris castle. 
of Hell Blasters with the the Emperor Ascended banner, all surrounded by bubble wrap. So there was no way I was getting in there. And I realized, hey, this is probably a game I'm going to draw at. So I I waited until he had no longer uh, he he lost the ability to. Uh, win the game and then I tried to win it I had one desperate play to try and win that game and of course it fell apart so we just had a draw um, so apart from that I played to win um, in every game but as the games went on I found myself with so few models on the board um, I had to think on the fly and actively play not to lose at points so that's a, that was a big downside of the list I took which I knew at the start I knew I was taking quite, a, quite an elite army and um, it really showed because uh, I think I ended two games with just Hellbrecht and my Thunderfire Cannon left and neither of those uh, games I lost. Funnily enough, I, I won one of those games and I drew one of those games. So, yeah. Um, I think some of the, the issues I came up against was that I was using a bit of guard tactics uh, while using a space moon list. Now, that's not unexpected. I've been playing guard straight for about two years. So switching to a new army is always going to take, take me some while to unlearn some of the tactics and things that I, I was doing. But what I was doing, I was, I was trying to saturate the entire board Um and just kind of nibbling at the enemy with infantry. Um, and I kind of used this this style in a couple of games, in my early games, but I found I just didn't have the staying power to make it hold. Now, with with guard, what you do there is you move, usually move advance or move, 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 double move your, um, your units into position, and then you just kind of snipe at the enemy being annoying and just nibbling away while you're sitting on objectives and j just be irritating, just irritating enough to not make them think whether they need to kill you or don't. And then hopefully by the end of the game, they're realizing, hey, I actually needed to kill those guys and I didn't. Um, so I tried doing that, but then I found <laughs> my guys weren't surviving long enough to make it relevant because they were dying to just menial shooting. So their big shooting was still going at the things I wanted to shoot at and they were ignoring those. But when they would just shoot like a scout squad or uh, a five-man Dire Avengers, I was losing too many guys to make that playable, playable choice. So I switched kind of mid-event over to what I believe is a far better tactic, which is surgical strikes. My army had uh, quite a bit of deep striking and a, a half-decent alpha strike. So what I would do is isolate or even at times bait my opponent into overextending. I did this by using the land raider as the crux of this play. Um, every opponent I played wanted to charge that land raider to stop it from shooting. And so what I'd do is I'd make it look like I pushed that land raider up too far. Like I even sometimes even move in advance at first turn, usually because it wasn't in range anyway. And then people would think, oh, he's overextended and they'd go for a charge. And when they charged it or they connected with it, um, then I would deep strike my uh, double, my, my du double plasma um, multi-melter units, the two of those onto it. And either that and plus my terminators and then I'd swamp whatever they, they did. Either that or the unit they used to charge me left them exposed and I dropped those guys in the back line. Now, Overall, it was an amazing event. And I've got to tell you guys, the team at Hive City did really well. Like over, I think there's nine or 10 of us in the group now, but six of us cracked the top 20 at the event and two of us cracked the top 10. So we all we all did really well, really well at this event. And we should, I think we should be proud of ourselves for that. Um, now, just to show you that this isn't a top tier competitive event, the top list at this event were Primary Space Marines, Death Guard, and Grey Knights. So that just puts things into perspective. This isn't a, this isn't a list to be like, oh my god, these are winning list, blah 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 blah. Thinking this is going to change the meta at all. This was uh, these were armies that were beautifully painted, well played, and played by people who are quite respected in the community and were respectful to their opponents. And that's what this means. This means that these are three guys who were all top blokes on the day. But truly, this was. Arc weekend was a great weekend. Uh, I'm proud of my placing and of my first my first outing with Templars. Now that's it for the Arc overview, and I'm going to move on now to a tactical dissection of my list, unit by unit. And I've got a verdict system: a thumbs up, a thumbs down, or a Zangief. <laughs> if you don't know what the Zangief is about, if you ever watched that shitty uh, shitty Jean Claude Van Damme rendition of uh, the Street Fighter, the Zangief he always does the thumbs up sideways. So thumbs up sideways is a Zangief, and which means I'm not sure about the unit yet. It could be good, it could be bad. Well, the jury's still out. So the first uh, one on the chopping block, going from top down, is the HQ, which is Hellbrecht. And this guy was amazing. He comboed incredibly well with the Land Raider Crusader and was a huge beat stick. When armies would try and charge that Land Raider to tie it up, um, that shitty Warlord trait that I complained about that gives him a six inch uh, heroic intervention came in pretty handy and um, the two, as the two were usually running in tandem people did not see that coming they would charge that Hellbreak would go from one side of Land Raider to the other side of Land Raider and kick the shit out of him it was great 
um, his D3 attacks on the charge and then being able to make him atta uh, attack twice or attack again when he dies gives him the amazing ability to take down things vastly more imposing than him. And my verdict on him is a thumbs up. He is solid. Next on the list is the Assault Terminators with all Thunderhammer Storm Shields. And these guys are pretty meh, if I'm honest, uh, for their points. In the games where they deep struck and made their 9-inch charge, they didn't disappoint at all. But in 4 of the 6 games, they failed that charge and gave up their points pretty easily in return. Although it was great at times when I had like one, I think in, in one occasion I had one guy left and my opponent would shoot the full Devastator squad at it and he just bounced them off for two turns. It was, it was fucking good, that was. Um, the unit's, uh, it's solid, but 2,230 points for it is nowhere near enough to justify its return. I love the models. I'm going to continue using them, but only for very specific lists. Um, overall, these guys are a thumbs down. Crusader Squads is next. They're a really solid troops choice. Um, they enable full access to Alpha Strike armies whilst making a battalion and filling my troop slot, um, which is something I think is actually really, really valuable, and I'm going to be building into that later. Um, and the idea behind that is because I can use my troops choice to play into my overall concept, my overall Alpha Strike deep striking concept, and they can also add significant firepower to that concept. Um, they're a good unit in that in that list. So. The ability to take one heavy weapon, one special weapon, and a combi weapon in a five-man is amazing. Now, I took multi-melters. Do you know what the biggest piece of utter fucking garbage that I'll never run again is? It's called a multi-melter. <laughs> they were shit house. They were so shit, I would have rather had a heavy bolter 10 times out of 10. And I would have saved myself 18 points in the process. Now, I think melter is actually really really weak at the moment and it needs a buff i think it either needs plus one strength or plus one to wound when in half range so over six games these multi melters did sweet fa the only notable thing they did over six games was one of them taking four wounds off a wave serpent i will never run <laughs> multi melters again and they multi melters get a solid 100 percent thumbs down in every way Crusaders are good though. <laughs> so apart from my mini alpha drop, which worked in most games and did what it was made to do, uh, putting a power sword on that, on that sword brother came in actually really handy. So when I uh, deep strike those guys out of the, the drop pot, they both got, so I've got two guy, two units, each one has a plasma, combi plasma and the multi melter and I put a power sword on each of the, the sword brothers. Now they both have nine inch charges with rerolls. So the likelihood of me getting one of those in is pretty high. Um, I'm have, have essentially have four goes to get a nine inch, to get a nine on two dives. Now, one of the hilarious highlights of this event was when I had two guys left in a uh, Crusader squad. I had the plasma gun and then I had the, 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 the sergeant with the plasma, the comic plasma and the power sword. So they got charged by five uh, space marines and <laughs> not only did the sword brother kill two guys on Overwatch, but they swung and they killed the the single remaining guy with the plasma gun. Then the sword brother swung back, killed two dudes, and the, the last guy ran away. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> that's I love that shit. That's the, that's the best things about Warhammer. Like a lot of the time, just retarded stuff like that. That shouldn't actually happen. It happens, and you both laugh your ass off. Um, that guy is is such a dude, and he's going to get uh, an extra special decal one day. So the verdict for these guys is thumbs up, multi-melters, fuck off. Okay, Land Raider Crusader. I love this thing. Now, it's a little bit disappointing because it's a Land Raider and it should be a lot more survivable than it is because it dies way too easy for its points. And being tagged by one Dire Avenger in one of my games to stop me from shooting really shit me up the wall. <laughs> but when it shoots, it's pretty impressive. Adding Hellbreak to it is amazing. Um, now, unfortunately, I'm not quite sure how this guy's going to go in a top table environment, and I'm leaning towards it probably being a liability in competitive events, but in this one, it did an amazing job. It pretty much took off a minimum of two units a turn. Every turn, it was firing. Um, but unfortunately, because I think this guy's going to be a liability later, like in, in bigger 2,000 point games, where people just have the firepower to just go bang, go on, top of turn one, I think I'm going to give this guy Zangief as I'm not sure about his applications going forward. In, in an environment where I can put enough threats on the board that people just don't auto-target it every game, 
it can be good. But if I don't have like a knight or something that's like another land raid or something that's as scary or scarier than it, it's just going to die like top of turn one. So got to give it a Zangief, but its output and its, its utility is fucking solid. Okay, next on to the actual all-star of my army list, which is the Thunderfire Cannon. This thing did not die in any games. It is still not being killed in any game that I've played with, with it. And it always killed and always got me an objective in every objective game. The stratagem was actually actually won me one of my games, as it was all the only thing that stopped an opponent from running onto objective for a draw. It was I wasn't going to lose that game, but had I not used that stratagem, it, I would have gotten a draw instead of a win. Now its best application was when I'd I drop my my special weapons in my drop pod, and they'd get out, and they'd like in one game they wasted I think uh, seven out of ten uh, dark reapers. Now that guy had three left. And he, I just knew he was going to use two CP to keep those guys. And they were worth a point. They were firstly they were worth first blood if they went down, and secondly they were worth an extra point if I killed them due to them being the most expensive thing my opponent had, which was one of the mission uh, bonus points. Now of course he was a savvy bloke, and when I killed those guys, the ones he took away were the ones that were in line of sight. So because he knew I had a land raider crusader that could shoot, I had some other bolters that could shoot. So he took away so I couldn't see him. In comes the thunderfire cannon. I wasted those three dudes, and it was great. It got me two points. On top of that, he was sitting in that game. He was sitting on objective all game and got me another point at the end. Now, it's amazing at finishing off units. Your opponent wants to hide, and it's very hard to shift with T six and a two plus save because you're always going to put it in cover. And then on top of that, you got your tech marine's ability to repair it. Like I can't say more, much more about it, guys. I doubt I'll be running many armies without this one in, the, in the, without this unit in the future. It's actually just really solid. It's. And it's not what you'd think. It's not a solid killing unit. It doesn't it doesn't kill that well. It's got essentially uh, 4d6 heavy bolter shots, which is good. It's solid. At 40 inch range, no line of sight. That's a good unit. Uh, but it's not because it's got outright firepower. It's good because it's got reliability. And because on top of that, it's got a nice layer of synergy with that stratagem, which can really lock down your opponents like best units. All right. The last unit, the lowly drop pod. Now this guy did good. He did pretty good. He only died once. And in every game, I put it on an objective or I put it to get line breaker. And seeing as it only died once, that means it got me a minimum of five points across the, the tournament, which is pretty decent when you look at it. Like when you think about it like that, it got me five points out of six games. That's legit. That's a unit you want to take. At 85 points, <laughs> the price tag is a bit much and it's a big limiting factor. If it was the same price as a Rhino, I would be taking a shitload more of them. Unfortunately, it's a bit too expensive still. But as it might get relegated to fluffy events, like I might not be using this in competitive events, even though I do have some grand plans for it. I do have some competitive lists that I've been cooking up where which use the drop pods and I think make good use of them. And you're going to be seeing one of those pretty soon, I think. But I think overall the jury is still out on this guy and he's going to get a Zangief. Um, really good at this event, but I think like the Land Raider, his application is going to be limited to lower points games. When my opponent can turn, uh, you know, he's got enough stuff in his army, in a 2,000 point army, that he can just turn one unit of Devastators to kill, taking out a drop pod and not, not be missing out on, on too much fire. It'll start looking a lot shitter. So yeah, a Zangief, a Zangief for the drop pod. Overall, with the exception of the Termies, the army did about as well as I expected. Um, and when it all worked, it worked out really well. Like I was able to smash my opponent's key units pretty quickly and neutralize most of the major threats. Uh, when I was unable to, I parked myself on objectives and did the best I could to keep them, I guess. But overall, pretty happy with the list, and I learned a shitload about playing Black Templars, so that's great. The biggest takeaway was um, the knowledge that I need to get myself out of my my guard head, you know, my head that thinks, ah, oh, and acts like I've got three times as many models as I do. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Now we're on to the big controversial kind of topic in the in the scene at the moment which is slow play now firstly i want to define to you guys what it is that is going on here firstly slow play is you being using is being used as a term for a lot of different things um, and it's kind of been using as a broad brush for, for many different issues with the game and different actions so firstly it's been used to describe people who just take too long with their actions during a game and just doing those actions slower than others and as such, do not finish games. Secondly, it's being used to describe players who actively slow play as a way of 
gaining advantage. And so you, if you think you're going to lose or you think you're going to be in a better position if the game does not end, then they play slower on purpose. And lastly, players who bring lists that are incapable of finishing the game. So firstly, I need to dispel something that G-Dub has stated, and that is that the game plays faster. This is pretty much categorically proven to be incorrect. At the end of 7th, games weren't ending, but this was kind of due, due to the rules bloat and getting super units that had like two shooting phases or two movement phases or a movement phase with 90 models that needed like an hour in itself because it was so important to not be blocked with your hit and run and all that other shit. And then on top of that, it had a pretty clunky psychic phase that was a really long process to just kind of dump into the game. In 8th, eight, like games aren't finishing due to several kind of basic factors that I've identified. Uh, for the first time in a long time, horde armies are actually good, and <laughs> therefore we're seeing models in numbers that we have not seen probably ever. Like, I, I can't think the last time I actually saw, like, I, well, shit, I played Guard all the way through 7th edition, and there wasn't a single game where I took more than 50 infantry. Like, it wasn't a single one, and there were veterans in transports, like, that was it. So, that's a big thing to notice. The other big one, and this is the, probably the bigger one, um, now with first turn charges and deep strikes, you can be locked in combat and playing every phase of the game from turn one. Now in seventh edition, uh, the first, usually the first couple of turns of the game, you'd be jockeying for position and usually just either playing a psychic phase and a shooting phase or neither, neither. You're just kind of jockeying for position, getting on objectives, setting yourself up. Now in eighth edition, everything's happening every turn and it just take, makes it take longer. Like that's, that's all there is to it with everything happening every turn, of course things are going to go longer. Like, that's, that's pretty basic. And it's just a vast, vastly longer experience altogether. And those are just the ones I identified. I'm sure there's more, there's more out there. Now, here is my first big statement. Finishing a game is everyone's responsibility, regardless of what army you play. This is a two-player game, and both players must be striving to get a natural conclusion. Second big statement. Very few instances of slow play are malicious. Most of the time, you will know if this happens to you. Your player will go from playing normally and naturally at a regular pace to playing far slower, and it will stand out like you won't believe. If this happens to you, report it to a TO ASAP. No, no ifs, no buts, just do it. Third big statement. If you are playing an army that can never naturally finish a game, change your army. This is unfair to your opponent and to you. You are denying your opponent a full and satisfying experience, and you are denying yourself possibly the best part of the game, in my opinion, the last two turns, where you got to see if that single guardsman makes that five-inch charge to cinch the game, or will I roll a four on this damage roll to make this single fire dragon a hero by killing Magnus? Also, further to this, in formats with progressive and cumulative scoring, you will get left behind no matter how well you do in those first three turns of your game that's not ending. So if you are playing an army that struggles to finish games, not one that, in, that is incapable of finishing, but struggles, what are some things you can do? Firstly, one of the biggest time consumers and one of the most easy things to cut out of your game is canning dice. When you take your dice out of your dice cube at the start of a game, break it down into increments applicable to your army. For example, if you have troops, uh, a six-man troops choice that shoots between five and ten shots each, you get a few piles of fives together at the start of the game, put them to one side, and uh, leave a pile of ten or so for you to roll saves on or for all your psychic dice on. That's just something that's really easy. At the start of this edition, when I was playing my eight mortar teams, and I was, I was being a bit of a dick, really, um, I would always use this little trick where I had ten dice in my left hand and three dice in my right hand. So the three dice were to, was to see how many shots I got, and the ten dice was to roll the hits. Now, with the average on three dice, the vast majority of the time and the vast majority of the averages mean I was only ever usually taking one dice out of my hand or adding one into that 10. I was either rolling 10, rolling 9, or rolling 11. This sped up my games immensely and enabled me to finish games while playing guard hordes. Another way to cut down on time is to help your opponent in their phases. Uh, naturally, you've got to do this with their permission. You've got to be really open, really honest, and always check their intentions for a unit before you touch it. So there can be no cock-ups. Uh, the best example of this is in the first movement phase of the game. If you're going to help, if you're going to help your opponent in any phase that you think they need it, firstly, of course, ask if they need it, and then uh, say, "Hey, would you like me to help you move in the first turn? I can not help you move in the other in the other turns, but in the first turn, if you're just going to be moving straight forward, I can help you move those twenty termagants." 
because it's always plottable where they're going to end up relative to where they were. And if they're playing a horde army, that means they've most likely got something on the deployment line, and which means that that's why their movement is plottable. If you're moving forwards, e.g. a Space Marine Scout in Dawn of War deployment, moves six inches. It means they can never be closer than six inches from the center of the line of the board, plus any advance, of course. So if they roll a two, they move eight inches. They should be four inches from that center line, etc., etc. So you can move this unit with confidence and your opponent can easily verify its position relative to where it started. And later turns, this gets harder and harder and it relies on kind of having a good rapport and kind of clear instructions from your opponent. But it's, it's something that is very doable and I advise something I advise to do, especially if you're playing in a, in a tournament that has sports scores. You'll get a good sports score from helping your opponent as long as you're open, honest, and transparent about what you're doing with units. And you, as soon as you take your finger off that last unit you've moved for them, you check with them that they're happy with it and you give them every opportunity to move it if they're not happy. Okay, now moving on from that, a phase that gets overlooked for a lot of time usage is the deployment phase. If you are in a tournament, tournament environment and you know time will be an issue for the list you're bringing, always have your deployments mapped out in your head prior to attending. Everyone knows, so you, when you go to a tournament, there's only six options for deployments, and that will be used at each, each event. They're never going to change, really, unless they're, they're doing their own bespoke ones at fluffy events. When you're writing your list, have these in mind and get a good understanding of how to deploy in, in, in each of the two ways you need to, aggressive and defensive. If you're playing a gun line or mass uh, deep strike, alpha strike, you only need to need one. You need to you know work one of these into your, your thinking. But every army should be able to deploy two ways: aggressively and defensively. Now you know you know that sometimes you're going to get dawn of war. So plan for those. Plan to be able to chuck down your stuff in dawn of war and know exactly where you need stuff to go. Look at the matchup and go: I need aggressive or I need defensive. And soon enough, you'll have those down pat and you'll be able to tweak with them. You'll be able to mess with them. Say, oh, yep, I don't need that one there this time because of, I'm against this list. I can put that one out on the left on the flank and it can be a bit more of a harassing unit or I um, don't need to use that one um, so aggressively in this one. I can sacrifice that to hold an objective instead. And that'll just help you grow in some of those ways. And speeding up the deployment phase really adds layers to your game because it just it just gives you a lot more time to, to think. When you're down, the, every, every second you save in the movement phase, and the deployment phase is a second you get to think at turn six, turn seven, when the game's in the balance. And lastly, this is, and this is just a really basic one, be aware of the time throughout the game. If you're unsure how much time you have left, it is much better for you to take 30 seconds and find out from a TO than to rush in through your game and find that you don't have enough time to finish it. You're much better being informed about where you stand. And so you can plan accordingly. Now, if you can, keep the time yourself. Keep a, get the schedule out of the from the players packet, which most tournaments have, and put it next to you. Carry it with you. Put it in your back pocket. So you're like, oh, how long have we got left? Oh, this game finishes at 2.30. What time is it now? Uh, it's 2 o'clock. We've got half an hour, et cetera. Keep yourself informed. Like There's no there's no reason not to. And it'll, it'll help you play better and help you know where you stand in a game. So I hope that gave you some good ideas, guys, about speed up your game. Slow play isn't going away anytime soon, but it's definitely manageable. Um, like I said, if you feel like you're being maliciously slow play, like someone is actively playing slower than their ability, um, report it, you know, certainly, certainly flag it to a TO because it, the worst thing you can do is say nothing and then it happens to four or five more people in, a, in an event. So yeah, I hope that helped guys. And, uh, moving on to wrapping up this episode, my closing thoughts, I am still loving this army. Um, I'm looking forward to my next event, which is laws of war in Brisbane in about a month's time. And I'm getting stuck into a bunch of new units for it. And I'm going to be going over those in the next few episodes uh, with a full army list and rundown and breakdown and tactical uh, dissection in a week before in the week before the event. And actually, I'll be doing that again on the other side of the event. So some news from Hive City. We have a Custodes uh, Codex review dropping on the channel this week, and we're recording a bunch of new battle reports in the in the coming weeks. Unfortunately, there's been a little bit of a gap in our continuity, and that happened because of Arc Weekend and having to, to plan a lot of stuff around that. Um, some tips for you guys is to, like I said before, get comfortable with how long it takes to play your chosen army. If you need to trim sections of it in order to complete games, do it. Or try some of the tricks I noted. Like hell, give movement trays a go if that's applicable. If that's something that's applicable to your army, um, there's plenty of uh, secondhand, sorry, third third party retailers popping up with stuff to speed up your game. So look into them. If you're struggling to finish uh, games and it's you're not doing it on purpose, you've nothing to worry about. Just just put in the work and you'll have no issues. Um, 
Next, I'd like to thank everyone who approached me at ARC. You guys are amazing. And um, thank you so much for the feedback, guys. It's all been so positive. I'm fucking blown away by it. Uh, you guys are all top dudes. And uh, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And hopefully I'll be around to years, for years and years to come. So thanks for everything, guys. Thanks for your support. So lastly, to round out the episode today, I just wanted to tell you about something that happened to me at ARC. Um, in my first episode, I detailed a bit of my story and I told you guys about uh, being kind of listless and uh, monstrously lonely and kind of searching for meaning in my life and that I, uh, I walked past this GW in um, Southland and the guy there sat me down and he gave me a paintbrush and he gave me a space marine to paint and uh, put me into this hobby, this hobby that I love and I've, I've dedicated a lot of my time and my life to. Now, I ran into that guy at ARC. He uh, rocked up with, um, I think, his partner and uh he, he came up to me and he said hey man i love the podcast and uh like I, I was i was blown away that he listened to it firstly and secondly um i got a little bit emotional and i had to ask him and I asked him um did you know how fucked up i was then and he said yeah i did and um i gave him a big fucking hug and i cried and it was a it was an amazing moment guys and uh, that's one of the things i love about this hobby we're not just a group of nerds like we're a group of people who give a fuck about each other we're a, we're a community and um it's moments like that that um really inspire me to want to, to want to do more for this community, to want to participate more, to want to go to more events, to want to put myself out there more. And um, like, I'm really proud that I, I was able to share that moment with that guy. And I'm really grateful to him for what he's done for me. So thanks guys. That's it for this episode. And um, see you again next time. Bye.